So welcome to the, um, the final of the Loch Arbor Winter Talks. Um, so tonight we have a presentation on the history of the club. It's a slightly different format to what we've done on the, the previous talks as tonight we have two speakers um, as I'll be discussing with our current Commodore Hamish Loudon about his memories of the club from its inception in 1954 to current day. So the, the orange, origins of the club are linked to the foundry, um, which at the time had a, a motor cruiser called Morag. So Hamish, can you tell us what your memories are of the Morag and tell us a little bit about the unusual reason that the club was founded? Yes, the, the Morag was a lovely uh, motor cruiser from Silver's Yard. Uh, looked a lot better than it does in the picture. And it was kept in a mooring at Corpoch and used um, for cruises for the, the management teams. And of course, it took them all the way around through Corden and up to the smelter at uh, Kinloch Leven. And uh, it had a permanent skipper and uh, even had a boat boy. So it was kept in rather sparkling condition. <coughs> and the, um, so how did the Yacht Club come about then? Well, <clears throat> the, the company were very keen to um, advertise aluminium as a ideal material for yacht and large boat construction. So uh, the Moor of Moor uh, catch was built and it was kept over at Corpac as well initially. And <clears throat> it was on the Lloyd's register, but um, that, that was the hope, but uh, it couldn't be registered there because the Alcan, as it was, was not a member of a yacht club and there's no uh, club could be found. The, the answer was for the BA to actually form uh, a yacht club, hence La Habe Yacht Club in 1954. <clears throat> um, the, the Alcan Certainly. Sorry, on you go. Because they certainly a, a sort of unusual way for a club to be founded. Yeah, it, there's, there's a lot of the original correspondence about it, uh, but they, they did register with the RYA and um, <coughs> were, were recognised. So uh, after that, the, um, there was a lot of local interest uh, from small boat owners, but the Alcan um, bequeathed two Barnum class uh, dinghies, the um, Gunter rigged, clinker built, rather like um, the naval sailing dinghies. <clears throat> and they were used for, for match racing uh, for a couple of years. <clears throat> Prior to that, I mean, were, were there many boats seen in the loch? Was there much sailing? Yes, there was, there was a handful, there was five or six. Um, local sailing boats of various rigs <clears throat> and after being sailing on the loch one in fact was owned by uh, the local surgeon and then they were just pulled up in the foreshore and sails rolled up and left until the next time they went out so it was all very casual yeah <clears throat> so going back to um more ag more you know the, the reason the club was founded um i did some googling on that and I, I seem to find some information about her. It seems that, you know, after being based in Corfpac for a while, um, in the 1970s, she moved down and spent the winters in the Hamble, and then the summer months sort of cruising around the, the Channel Islands and sort of northern France. Um, and then it seemed to be sold by BA in the 1980s, and I think that's where I found that the trail went uh, a bit blank about more Agmore. <clears throat> yeah, she, she was campaigned a lot along the south coast and especially around um, the Hamble, uh, <clears throat> trying to raise interest in the, the idea of, uh, of uh, using aluminium as opposed to wood. Um, the advent of GRP construction was not <clears throat> widely accepted uh, just at that point. Um, <clears throat> the last I, I heard of it um, was she was in the Caribbean in looking uh, in a pretty poor state. Um, that's where my trail went cold on it. <clears throat> she was very unusual in that um, she was twin-engined and uh, obviously twin-prop, twin-rudders, twin 
highly unusual um, for a boat at that time, and of course had fairly uh, luxurious accommodation, which I suppose was part of the key of, of getting uh, <coughs> trade and individuals on board to persuade them to buy more aluminium. Yeah. Okay, so moving on, I mean, the, the first clubhouse that the club had, how did that come about? <laughs> well, that, that was um, under pressure from <clears throat> one of the early Commodores, um, Vet Michael Carmichael, because <clears throat> by that time the existing small boats had gravitated to Corpach, and the old naval base had uh, missing huts to spare. You can see the original condition on the left-hand side. Uh, <clears throat> that was a, a canoe under construction, and uh, when the club got the Nissen hut, it had no facilities, and they, you can see that the members built a hard standing path all the way around and managed to get connected to electricity, but that was it. Um, no, no other facilities. Uh, <clears throat> so I guess pretty basic inside, what, just a, a few tables and chairs. That, that was it, and it was really to store the, the spare gear from the dinghies, the sails and paddles and rudder and tiller. Yeah. <clears throat> um, the lower picture is, um, that, that's the early days of the, the start of uh, home construction from GP14s. And uh, <clears throat> the pier in the background is part, is part of the original naval base uh, construction. Yep. So in the early days, um, you know, I think what you told me is a lot of the dinghies were, were homemade and we've got a picture here of Robbie Robertson's dinghy. So what can you tell us about that one? Well, I hope Robbie is listening and will correct me if I'm wrong at the end. <clears throat> but uh, Robbie and his dad were founder members and um, they joined the, the yacht club and it was then that the small boat section. So from the drawings and um, wood assembled from various nefarious sources, they, they built the boat. Uh, <clears throat> the mast and the, the sails came from an old uh, naval dinghy. Uh, the shrouds were fence wire, but the whole lot um, cost about 20 pounds. And uh, at the end of the day's sailing, they just pulled it up on the slipway down at the town pier. That's the original slipper you see there, uh, where the, the hub of activity with the railway station, the, uh, <coughs> the steamer pier and the, the bus centre, a, a proper ha transport hub. <coughs> yeah. So the, the club seemed to have a, a fleet of home-built uh, GP14s. Um, yes, so by either by probably by accident and design, um, the, the GP14 was ideal for home construction and um, that was <coughs> adopted by the club and we had six or seven home constructed GP14s and uh, <coughs> a trophy, the Simpson trophy was awarded for racing, for, for one design racing and that was going to be GP14s but the first uh, season the trophy was awarded, there were insufficient um, GP14s. So the handful of those plus the uh, two Burnhams and the Sea Cadet Whaler um, was allowed to enter. I think the Sea Cadets have been <coughs> quite helpful uh, launching and recovering boats. And as it turned out, conditions were ideal for a heavy 2700 weight whaler and the Sea Cadets, much to everybody's astonishment, actually won the trophy. So if you're ever looking at the Simpson Trophy, the first name on the list is Sea Cadets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, back in these early days, they also seemed to have a bit of a social scene as well as a sailing scene. Um, this picture, I think, dates from the 1960s. Um, you know, were there many events held like that? Yes, there was, there was quite a lot. That was the, the, the annual uh, prize giving and dinner dance used to be held in the Grand Hotel. Um, <clears throat> of course, burnt down now the site of Weatherspoons. But yeah, there were several social events throughout the, the season. And um, 
on the right uh, is the very first mirror dinghy in the club, another home construction, and that was built by Adrian Hope. Um, we're still over at Corpork and the, in the background you see the big sheds and the slipway, that was where the motor gunboats and motor torpedo boats were hauled up for uh, maintenance during the war. So it was, it was, uh, that's the site where um, <clears throat> the pulp mill and all the other construction is now. Yeah, <clears throat> it's changed a bit. <laughs> Just a bit. <laughs> so. Um, in 1963, the, the club moved from the old Nissen hut um, to what's called the, the old mill. So why did that come about? Yeah, that, that was um, a happy uh, chance that um, Mick Sutton, who had a, a shop in Corpor <coughs> before he moved over to the uh, caravan site, uh, family owned the old mill. In fact, when we moved in, the old, the old millstones were still outside. Uh, we had to construct a, a slipway. You can see it under construction there, but the <clears throat> materials were short and so was labour. So it was constructed just wide enough to take a launching trolley. Uh, <clears throat> and on the clubhouse itself, uh, the members built the veranda. Um, and that's the, <clears throat> the then Commodore Mike Carmichael hauling up one of the home built GP 14s. <clears throat> um, Hidden on the right is a catamaran that was home built by Mick Sutton, one of the very first uh, cats in the club. Yeah, and it seems that the, the Commodore at that time had the, the job of uh, emptying the outhouse toilet, so I bet you're yes, glad that, you don't have to we, do we, that any longer. <laughs> having got um, shelter and power, running water, uh, but no toilet, so the, the then Commodore has met primary task was after each event was emptying the chemical toilet. Um, luckily today, the Commodore's primary duty is just to make sure that the green and the blue bins get put out for collection. Happier <laughs> task. Uh, yeah, I think so. <clears throat> so when the pulp mill was built, it kind of really ended the, the sailing activities in this area. Um, so when, what was the, the reason yes, for that? Yes, that, that was um, unfortunate because it was it was very active, as you can see, but the, the pulp was brought in by ship and a large um, tube came ashore uh, not far from the club. And of course that construction virtually fouled up the, the start line and it really um, limited um, sail, well certainly racing activities, which were very keen in those days. Mm -hmm. So we started to, to uh, look around uh, for an alternative site. <clears throat> yeah. I believe um, back in these days there were also some passage races that we still have today. I think there's the Loch Eel race and the Black Rock. Yes, that was um, <clears throat> uh, a sort of passage race for, for dinghies. So the race from Corpor to um, Loch Eel, so about the site of um, out, Outward Bound, that was a comparatively short race if you timed it with the tides correctly. But you can imagine that the Black Rock was, was quite an endurance test. Um, and in fact, uh, on one fabulous occasion, it was won by a mirror dinghy, but uh, deserved a, a trophy for endurance or for nothing else. So, <clears throat> um, yep. the other interesting thing was that racing in those days, we had no race marks of our own. And so the courses were around the existing navigation marks on the islands. And of course, in those days, if when you're racing, if you touched a mark, you had to retire. But uh, very few people did because of rather substantial bits of ironware. <laughs> Yeah, or hitting an island. <laughs> so th th there's quite a few pictures of the, the sea cadets around that time. Um, they, they seem quite an adventurous bunch. Yes, they were. Of course, it's a long time ago and, and society was very, very different. Uh, <clears throat> no computers and no mobile phones. Uh, the team on the left were very much the team that won the Simpson Trophy. But that was at an athletics meeting. The, uh, 
one's in uniform and it's about the place where um, slippery autos are now. <clears throat> because there's still a large ceremonial mass there um, for, for colours. Uh, unfortunately, when we decided to paint it, we didn't get the mechanics of lowering the mass properly. And it came down with a rush and got broken. So we, we were in pretty bad order over that. <laughs> but <coughs> things improved. Uh, when Adrian Hope was um, CEO of the, of the unit, uh, <coughs> they took two mirror dinghies up to the lock and halfway up Ben Nevis um, and, and rigged them and sailed them and claimed the, the, the altitude record for sailing in the United Kingdom. Um, strange to report, uh, it's quite a squad, as you can imagine, carrying all the bits. And at the end of the day, there was nothing missing and no damage. So that was an achievement in itself. But uh, I don't think there's been any other attempts to <laughs> since, since 57 to... Uh, well, maybe, that. maybe that's a challenge we should throw down to the, <laughs> the latest sea cadets is to get them to replicate the, the sail. Well, hopefully they might be watching. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So what other boats did the, the Sea Cadets have? <clears throat> well, after the Simpson Trophy triumph, of course, it was decided that subsequently it would be for GP14s only. And uh, <clears throat> the Keen Bunch decided that they needed a GP14. So a local landowner, Lord Delverton, was persuaded to, to gift a, a boat to the club. But being a wise gent, he said, well, I'll give them a boat, but they'll have to build it. So two huge packing cases arrived with all the plans. <clears throat> and the 17 year old team set to and, and built it. And I certainly would hesitate to do that today. But they built it and, and continue to win races. So yeah. uh, quite an achievement. <laughs> it was. <laughs> So, so as well as have, having dinghies, um, sort of the first of the keel boats started to appear in the loch. Uh, I believe this picture showing amulets was the first yes, one. Yes, that um, it's about this. It's about almost exactly like a folk boat, built by <coughs> resident Jim Cameron, and uh, <coughs> took him quite a while. But the only thing he didn't make, I think, were the sails, um, and. It was very, very successful, the clinker built, beautifully put together. Uh, <clears throat> but after uh, Jim died, it, it disappeared, but it was rescued from a barn in the north of England and uh, restored. And in fact, it's now, the last I heard, was in the uh, custody of Jim's son. And it's um, down at Dunstaffnage, looking quite immaculate. So that's... Um, Obviously, Jim made a very good job of, of building, as did the restorer. And we had a talk at the club on the restoration, but I do remember the telling phrase, if you really don't like someone, give them a wooden boat. <laughs> All its problems on the West Coast. <laughs> Keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so, as we said, the restricted sailing conditions and the smells at Corpac from the, the pulp mill resulted in the move of the club to the, the Ashburn site. So how did we end up moving into the Downies uh, huts? Well, <clears throat> by that time, sailing was taking place over at Fort William. Um, down where the clubhouse is now, we, we had all we had was a, uh, a workman's cabin as a starting box and a short mast. And the boats were pulled up on the on the grassy slope there. But when old man Downey retired, um, he bequeathed the his sheds uh, to the club. They roughly opened what was then the old school. And uh, at lunchtime, those of us in first and second year would come across to help uh, Mr. Downey to hold the planks and while well, he riveted the uh, planks in place. The, <clears throat> the bit of shed on the left, um, which you, it's, it's quite long, it was used to store the spars, uh, but it fell into disrepair and they removed that. Um, <clears throat> so th this was probably a regatta day with all the flags up. 
and, and yeah. we were there for quite a while. Mm. I guess the facilities were fairly basic in the sheds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> of course, we've put a new roof on it since then. Mm. <clears throat> so moving into the 1970s, um, it seemed to be a bit of a, a golden age for the club with uh, success and quite a few uh, championships as well as it's, further it was amazing. It was an amazing time for, for a very small club. Um, right across the spectrum from yachting to right down to the smallest dinghies, mirrors. Um, at one end, um, <clears throat> Ian Fife and Bubblegum had tremendous success at West Highland Week, uh, Tarbert Scottish Series, <clears throat> and then ultimately, and it's racing around the world. He did the passage race to Australia, T race, and the um, Cape to Rio race as well. And overlapping, but slightly and slightly later, uh, Alan Milton and a series of Pepsis um, <clears throat> was very successful at, at West Highland Week, um, Tarbert Scottish Series, and won the. Um, Sigma Nationals, I think, three times. Um, and that was in fleets of 70 or 80 boats. And then running down the, the classes, there was much further success. But you might want to mention some of Ian's. Um... Yeah, so I was, I was reading these newspaper uh, clippings from Ian Fife. So it seems that he had a, quite an eventful race in the, the Whitbreads Round the World race. Um, and on the leg from Cape Town, now I quote this directly from the newspaper, uh, the yacht was sexually assaulted by a school of 40 foot blue whales who attempted to mate with the yacht, toppling her on her side, causing 5,000 pounds worth of damage. On the same leg, the force day broke and then on the leg to New Zealand, they had to sa save on fresh water by cooking their potatoes in whiskey. <laughs> then a rudder bracket failed while rounding the Cape Horn and the Chilean Navy sent a ship to help and was towed into Puento Arenas and the hole plugged with plaster of Paris bandages from the medical kit. So <laughs> it seemed quite an eventful trip. <clears throat> well, on that particular leg, they, uh, they sailed quite some distance with um, a jury rigged uh, rudder and um, in quite rough seas. And in fact, uh, they were awarded the seamanship prize from the whole fleet uh, for their success um, in doing that before they were towed in. Yeah, it's quite impressive. <laughs> so, in just the mention, sorry, just mentioning the, the other successes on the dinghy fleet, um, we had uh, winners in the GP14 class um, twice, uh, won the Scottish Championships and a third place in the Nationals. Um, in the mirror dinghies, uh, twice winning the Scottish Championships, uh, and toppers it was phenomenal. We, we had a young man who was in the RWA squad and uh, came second in the uh, Topper Nationals. This is out of a fleet of over 100 boats, and, and third in the Worlds and when there was about 200 entries. Uh, so overall, you can see that it was um, one of those amazing uh, periods of success uh, for, for a very small club. Yeah, that's, that's <clears throat> impressive. <laughs> so in 1977, um, the first, one of the first major construction projects for the club was the, the building of the slipway. Um, <clears throat> was all this work done by the members? Um, this is um, <clears throat> getting away from the sailing activity. Um, the, the members were uh, quite a skilled bunch. We hope they're just about uh, representatives from every trade and profession. And <clears throat> this is on the site of the existing slipway, but um, before, long before the club was built, because we were actually, as I said, op operating from a, a workman's shelter as a starting box. And it was a very tiny slipway. Um, <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems everybody out with their shovels, it must have been uh, <laughs> hard work. I think we, we appreciate for all the work they put in back in these days. It was okay, and also quite resourceful. Um, 
Kenny Robertson there on the, the top top right, uh, he borrowed um, plant from the company <coughs> to, to help. So it was a pretty major undertaking at the time. Yeah. <clears throat> so I found this other newspaper article. Um, it was about a proposed marina in Corpac, and it was dated in 1979, where a local man, John Cuthbertson of Corpac Chandlers, had a very ambitious plans to go and build a marina himself. Obviously, it, it never happened, but it's really good to see 41 years later that we're finally getting a marina in Corpac. So let's hope we get the funding and we can get the, the pontoons and get this marina opened. Yeah, <clears throat> fantastic uh, addition. In fact, uh, this month's practical boat owner just arrived has got that very picture in it with a, a synopsis of where they're at. <clears throat> so it's um, getting, getting national uh, acclaim. Yeah, no, that's good. So the, the first um, major milestone for the club was the um, Silver Jubilee in 1979. This picture here is shown, showing Peter McLennan, who yep. was the Commodore at the time. He looks quite like a bit of a character. Um, I believe he was fundamental in getting the clubhouse built. <clears throat> yes, P Peter was a, a local businessman and a um, very resourceful, persuasive character. And <clears throat> we were having, we, we always needed uh, to get a, a, our own clubhouse built on the site we were sailing from. <clears throat> but we came up, like everybody else, you come up against planning permission, <laughs> a whole series of people whose job it is to say no. But uh, Peter <clears throat> wasn't to be rebuffed like that. And um, the story goes, um, quite, a, quite reliably informed, that he took a took from his shop a bottle of the finest malt and went to the house of the then chairman of the planning committee, Saki Makai. And after a, a portion, a fair proportion of this uh, bottle was consumed, hands were shaken and permission granted and it became official. So this is the first building to go on the log side of the A82 between Balahulish and Fort William. So clearly, he was a commodore of great charm. <laughs> a lesson for us all. <laughs> <laughs> so again, I, I guess the members had quite a big role in, in getting the clubhouse built. Yes, after the planning commission, um, we're very fortunate again uh, with members. Uh, Bill Bryce um, uh, was the architect to get the design um, approved and he had a great skill of um, getting his designs through through planning. And um, <clears throat> the club as its clubhouse itself was built by another member, Roddy Campbell of Campbell Homes, and who, who gave us a, a very, very reasonable price. So uh, once again, we're extremely fortunate uh, in the input of members. Yeah. I could see in uh, this one, the, the work party in action. <laughs> yes. Um, you see a, a, a much younger Andrew McKenna with a pick, uh, Donny Meldrum, myself, uh, Liz, and that's one of Donny's boys. Uh, <clears throat> on the right, uh, another member who made a major contribution, uh, Richard Romney, um, at that time had his own plant. <clears throat> and where the small dinghy park is now, there were a couple of big trees which uh, rather cramped our style, uh, but it didn't cramp Richard's style. Once, once we had a tree cut down, we had to get the roots out. But my abiding memory is um, this machine in a very unstable condition with nearly three tons at the end of the grab heading towards the shore. <laughs> Where luckily <laughs> he was able to deposit it and it's now encased in, in rocks. <laughs> So the, the, the clubhouse was officially opened in 1982. It seems quite a, a lavish ceremony going on there with you all in your Sunday best. Yeah, that was um, that was quite a day. Um, you can see there's quite a crowd for the opening. And uh, there in the middle is um, Commodore Peter handing over a, uh, a trophy to chairman of the planning uh, team. 
Uh, Adrian Hope there, I think Chris Strong. Um, so what okay. facilities did the clubhouse have? <clears throat> well, but this, this was Rolls Royce compared <laughs> to what we had. <laughs> you know, we had <clears throat> um, a veranda, we had a galley, changing rooms, toilets. Um, it was an absolutely wonderful day. Um, I think I was home and leave at the time. Uh, so my input was um, being able to drink to the health of the club, I think. Yes, I think we can see you in the, the picture in the, towards the right hand side uh, with the glass in hand. <laughs> yes, that's me with a, a, a darker beard. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also good to see in the right hand picture that uh, social distancing applied in 1982. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so moving back onto the water, um, looking at the, the sort of pictures from that time, it seemed that the 1980s were really a very active time for the club. Yes, it was um, very active in the dinghy world just at, around that time, I mean, apart from the, <clears throat> the competitive keel boats. I, I should mention amongst the competitive keel boats was um, uh, the late Peter Birrell, who had a 33-foot boat, and he entered the first um, race from Inverness to Bergen. It was the Bergen Yacht Club centenary. And uh, <clears throat> out of the, about 130 boats competed, but it was a hellish weather. Uh, a third of the fleet retired, two or three dismasted. But um, Peter won the class. So the, <clears throat> that was another occasion the club G was to the fore. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so in mainly, the 90s, sorry? It's in the early 1980s, um, the club became an RYA centre, I believe. Yes, that was um, a happy coincidence. Um, uh, down at the, uh, the Outward Bound Centre, the, the, the coach there met um, Adrian Hope, that uh, was Howard Green, and uh, asked when we were running courses. So, of course, we had to become a recognised training centre. Uh, and under, I think it was Adrian's guidance at the time, uh, that's what happened. And we, Howard ran the first course, and that qualified Adrian as instructor. And I'm fairly certain that Andy McKenna did the same course. So um, <clears throat> we, we can trace what some instructors right back to the, the, the early days. So we became, at the end of 82, we became a, a recognised training centre. Yeah. Uh, what I quite like looking at this picture, when you, you look back on the shore of uh, William, <laughs> nothing seems to have changed. No, um, <clears throat> we had, by this time we had lost the GP14s and we had had a period of uh, flying 15s as well, but uh, at this stage we had lost the class racing and we had a, a pretty motley collection of, of uh, dinghies, but still um, pretty, pretty active. But yeah. you can, where, where the large dinghy park is now, in front of Ashburn House, you can see that we had a very narrow strip of shore where we parked and um, no, no dinghy park at all. Yeah. So um, another thing that struck me looking at a lot of the photos from back in the 80s was the number of kids that seemed to be involved in the club compared to today. Yeah, it... it um, Computers and screens and mobile phones hadn't struck by that time. Uh, I think this is a scene from a, a, a Christmas party when uh, Santa arrived by uh, the club boat on the slipway um, with coloured flares going off and creating great excitement. <laughs> <clears throat> but on, on the water, you can see that the collection of youngsters there, that was after one of Howard Green's courses where um, he did the RYA levels one and two <clears throat> for juniors plus uh, seamanship. So uh, yeah, pretty pretty active then. But of course, ne Nether's Range hadn't opened, the uh, mountain biking hadn't started. Um, it certainly wasn't, I don't think there was a rugby club by then. So we were still one of the very few um, organised uh, outdoor activities available for youngsters. Yeah, there's a lot more competition for their time these days. Absolutely. 
Um, so around that time, we also seem to be doing weekend cruises and camping. Um, were trips like this quite common? Yes, they were. Um, <clears throat> I don't know whether the weather was better, or, but certainly um, dinghy sailors were, were about, uh, a different calibre when it came to enduring the outdoors. <clears throat> and the, there were several trips up Loch Hill for camping. And, some of the keel boats would go up and moor, raft up, and uh, <clears throat> they would then tow the dinghies home if the weather uh, was bad or there's no wind. But you can see in the bottom right, see there's, there's a mirror dinghy on the beach, and some of them actually, some of the mirror dinghy sailors carried their camping kit with them, uh, or <clears throat> some of the families would drive round by car uh, with, with the heavier camping gear. But yeah, it was um, it was very active times. Yeah, I'm not sure you would have too many volunteers these days <laughs> camping trips by dinghy. No internet connection there. <laughs> yeah. So in 1986, the slipway was extended. Um, what was the reason for that? Well, uh, the, the earlier um, building uh, probably ran out of time and money, but didn't get down to at the level of low water springs and uh, <clears throat> we wanted to make it a bit wider as well but you can see uh, Kenny Robertson there with a bit of plant excavating down near low water mark. <clears throat> so I guess all the work was done by the members yet again? Well, ex absolutely exclusively yeah. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah. And a few years after that, um, the, the moorings were put in, which must have been a real benefit for the keelboats. Yes, um, <clears throat> I think that was kicked off by Peter McLennan, phoned me up and said we need to get a solution to the moorings because the, the keelboats were all anchored around or moored around down in shade. And of course, in the strong winds, moorings dragged and yachts bang together. <clears throat> uh, we're very fortunate in those big concrete sinkers, they're about seven or eight tonne reinforced concrete. And for some reason on the army uh, doing some trials up at Kyle Hoch Alsh, um, then didn't need them. And so I was obliged to find a good home for them, <laughs> <laughs> put them out of sight. <laughs> but you can see that they're quite, quite substantial, uh, as were the there's a shot of the uh, um, ground chain which ran the whole length, line, runs the whole length of the of the trot, and how it's connected up. <clears throat> we were very fortunate um, in the large number of members' input, um, with uh, Peter McLennan, Richard Romney, um, and several others, and we had. Very fortunate again, uh, an Amy pal of mine was actually running the underwater center uh, pier at the time. So <laughs> we were able to lay out the whole kit at no cost and, and utilize his crane and um, all his gear uh, to lay it. Um, Ian Dewar was a, a prime mover in selecting the chain. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that was a, a pretty major undertaking. Yeah, it's, it seems like <laughs> it. So the, the following few slides are showing life um, on the water in the 1980s, the 1990s and the 2000s. And again, it's, it seems to be a lot of activity in the club. Yes, it's still, still pretty busy times. And whenever there was a, a, week, a clear weekend, it was declared uh, a picnic Sunday. And um, all the dinghy sailors would head over to Stonkregan, <coughs> uh, probably a couple of keel boats. And um, <coughs> the safety boats would take the picnic gear, the grannies and the dogs and everybody else who couldn't sail. Um, <laughs> but I've seen, I've seen as many as 40 people over at Stonkregan on a, on a sunny day. Yeah, maybe we should bring that back. Well, that's it. <laughs> and I think the bottom 
the bottom right picture is showing the frostbite race living up to its name. <laughs> yes, that, that used to have quite an entry. Um, well, traditionally, the last Sunday in March. Yeah. Hail, <coughs> rain or shine. <laughs> Except for coronavirus. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. So this one, you can see in the bottom right picture that the, the leisure centre has been used for some cat size training. Was this often used? Um, no, it, we, we did it two years running. Um, I suspect we didn't uh, have the didn't get permission to use. I'm not sure what happened, but we actually did a mirror dinghy in there and got it rigged. Um, that's Adrian Hope swimming, but the, the main purpose was to um, <coughs> teach uh, capsized recovery, especially for those that were a bit weary of the cold, but also for, give members a chance to get confidence in their buoyancy aids just to see if they did actually hold them up. Um, <coughs> Yeah, certainly more preferable getting wet in the warm pool than it is out in the cold loch. It, it, was, it was a fun day. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, going into the 2000s, I mean, there, there still seems a very active junior sailing. You know, these pictures here, yes, that, they're um, top us. <clears throat> that was in, in the main. Doddy Meldrum, uh, who's this senior instructor, he, he, he was one of the driving forces and gradually built up his gang of, of mirror sailors. Um, <clears throat> and of course that attracted the attention of uh, uh, travellers. We had we held several uh, travellers events for mirror dinghies and lasers. And I've seen, you know, 25 mirrors on the water. Um, so that, that was uh, quite exciting times. Um, yeah. Bottom right just shows a, a lunchtime gathering. Um, so once again, you can see the number of, of, of juniors that were learning to sail. Yeah. So in December 2001, there seemed to be a, a bit of a storm. Whatsoever. It, um, it was a classic combination of all factors. So we, we had a prolonged southwesterly gale with winds up to you know, over 100 miles an hour. Um, I predicted very big spring tide on an extremely low barometric pressure and this this created a, a tidal surge of 1.7 meters above datum so you can see what happened to the crano that, that was the level of, of uh, tide on that night <clears throat> of course what it did to the dinghy park was sweep all the boats up into a big heap and uh, it did a bit of wreckage and downs as well um, <clears throat> this heap of boats, it looks pretty horrific, but um, and it took us about three days to gently untangle them all. Uh, and in fact, there was this comparatively little damage, and I don't think there was very much lost from there was maybe a few paddles, but uh, <clears throat> the main damage, I think, was to the, the fence, which <laughs> retained everything from being washed into the ash burn. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it was good you had the, the willing volunteers to uh Yeah, we had a we had a big back. squad. Um and we needed everybody. <laughs> so next uh, sort of milestone for the club, 2004, um it was the Jubilee year, 50 years. And at that time you seemed to get the, the new rib, which we uh, still use today. So that, um, <clears throat> That was, uh, I think, uh, Cheryl was Commodore at the time, and um, we had our magic wand, and we got grants and club funds to get a, a new rib, which was a much more satisfactory safety boat than the old dory, uh, <coughs> and, and the little green tender, and both crafts still in use, so, yeah, um, I mean, money well spent. <laughs> In remarkably good condition, considering they're you know, both 17 years old. Yeah, well, well looked after. Yeah. So um, one of the darker days for the club was in November uh, 2006, when the clubhouse went in fire. So what do you remember about that event? Well, that was, <clears throat> I do remember about one o'clock in the morning getting a phone call. <clears throat> um, 
to say that there was flames at the clubhouse. And at the time I arrived there, the fire brigade were there, but uh, once it started, it, it went out very quickly. <clears throat> it seems that the uh, sails that were stored in the veranda outside the club um, <clears throat> was set alight either by accident or design by the people who <clears throat> gathered there to smoke uh, strange substances and uh, one, once the sails were alight it caught the rest of the timber and very very quickly destroyed the destroyed the whole thing. Yeah was anything salvageable? Well thanks to the members we retrieved most of the uh, kitchen chinaware and pots and pans and strangely enough the stove um, not the, <clears throat> the whole lot, uh, it was a bit blackened, but um, when Roddy Campbell's team cleared the site, uh, Roddy took the, the stove up to his workshop and it was thoroughly cleaned up and new glass in and uh, there it is still today. <laughs> I believe there's a story about how the stove originated. <laughs> yeah, it, <clears throat> um, Auntie McKenna and myself were on the Wayfarer Traveller circuit and it was end of season at Loch Lomond and we arrived one dirty Friday night, pretty cold and miserable. And lo and behold, there in the clubhouse was this fabulous roaring fire. So we decided we needed one. And um, six members uh, club together, purchased it and Rory Campbell built the plinth and uh, installed it. And yeah. In fact, you yourself are a qualified stoker. I do spend a lot of time standing by that <laughs> fire when it's a cold day. Yep. <laughs> so, I mean, it was a real achievement that from the, the date of the fire to, I think, under 18 months later, the new clubhouse was built. Um, so what can you tell us <coughs> that, about that? That was an incredible achievement. Um, a small, a very small team. In fact, that's probably why it succeeded. It was a very small team uh, led by um, Robbie Robertson, of course, inputs from uh, Bill Bryce, who did the design, um, and Roddy Campbell, the builder. <clears throat> so it's, it's built roughly on the same footprint, but added on, of course, is the um, race office and bar, and then to the northeast end, um, a toilet and <clears throat> accessibility for disabled sailors <clears throat> uh, and it was opened um, by Charles Kennedy and Pete Hyde was the Commodore at the time. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And also you know the, there's some pictures here showing the well, certainly the smaller dinghy park um, getting constructed. Yeah well during the, the year the season without a clubhouse uh, Roddy Campbell had a spare uh, big container which uh, <clears throat> he got um, delivered into the dinghy park. <clears throat> uh, also it became clear that we needed a, a drier storage for the uh, fuel for the stove so that required a fair bit of excavation. Uh, that's Adrian directing um, operations there. Um, Robbie Robertson <clears throat> viewing so that was another long-term pick and shovel job, um, largely undertaken by the members of the, what we call the Thursday Club. Uh, just in passing, uh, a Thursday Club was formed in 2001 when we cleared the storm damage and realised that <clears throat> a few people could do quite a lot achieved. <clears throat> It happens to be on a Thursday because like all major decisions, it um, occurred about halfway down the third pint in the grog when we decided that we'd all meet for coffee and do some work. And it just so happened that everybody uh, voted for Thursday and that suited. And that's the way it's been for the last 20 years. You can get your t-shirt later. <laughs> <laughs> so the... <coughs> Back on the water, I mean, the, the fun seems to be continuing into this latest century. Um, I guess yeah, over the still... years, there have been quite a lot of competitions held at the club. Yes, we've had um, <clears throat> uh, 
traveling travelers events and championships for lasers, toppers, uh, wave, wayfarers. Um, this is a sh I really like this shot. This is a some of the fleet from <clears throat> the Wayfarer Scottish Championship, and a very switched on photographer waited until this Wayfarer was in a favourable position at the front and leading the fleet. Um, I think I can guess who was there. <laughs> Unfortunately, we didn't stay there. I think that particular race we might have got third, but um, <coughs> it was uh, not it was good quite, enough. It was quite nice while it lasted. <laughs> um, yeah, we were still we were still running our way courses, and you can see this is um, uh, an adults course gathered round one of the um, training boats. <clears throat> this is a we had, we had quite a few uh, uh, laser travellers. Uh, I've seen uh, twenty lasers on the water competing. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and there's the days when dinghy dinghies really did travel. Yeah, and I guess in more recent years, well, we've had the, the RS400 Championships and the Solings Nationals. Well, the Soling, first Soling Nationals, we had 14 boats. It was tremendous. The <clears throat> RS400 was a, was a fabulous day. The sun shone and the wind blew, and it was just absolutely perfect. It wasn't so good the second day. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so... I guess you would like to see more events like that being held in the club in the future? It would be that um, Dinghy, the, the whole series of, of travellers events has, has um, dwindled quite a bit right across the country, uh, I have to say. But um, certainly the, the RS400 is a very, very active fleet and, and they still travel, so it would be nice to see them back. And of course, we have the, the Soling Nationals planned for later this year. Yep, a second weekend in September. Um, we're yeah. hoping to get uh, at least 10 boats up for that. We, the team that were here two years ago from France are, are said they're coming. Um, the entry from Australia is, is promised to turn up. So <clears throat> must must be doing something right. I think we think we probably feed them too well, Cheryl. Well. <laughs> And of course, as you mentioned earlier, the um, the Thursday Club's been around since two thousand and one. So um, this year will be our twentieth twentieth anniversary celebration, and you can yep, see in that picture it was still going strong. Uh, that that's a group of the usual suspects. <clears throat> and then, you know, I guess probably one of the biggest achievements. <laughs> recent years was getting this new rib shed, um, especially during the pandemic. It, it was, that was a major achievement. Um, we, we talked about it in committees for, for some time, but from actually saying, yes, let's do it, it didn't take long. Uh, largely thanks once again to members' inputs, people like John Gay fighting his way through the uh, planning regulations. Um, <clears throat> and. Uh, our master of ceremonies, uh, Tim Sims, who had actually built some of these, but Tim and his son, uh, they were the, um, the foreman of the project <coughs> after John had um, got all our permissions. Uh, and of course, being in a, a fairly obvious place, we, <coughs> we all had to adhere to um, uh, safety helmets and yellow jackets and so on. Um, and we were, I thought I'd say it myself that the squad were pretty well behaved and um, we, we never attracted any <laughs> adverse comments. <laughs> and we can see the, the finished product here. Yeah, that, that's some of the team. Um, it, it, Tim, the master of ceremony, his son. Uh, but uh, yeah, a, a very good outcome. Yeah, hopefully we'll get to use it lots this year. I hope so. So I mean, we've obviously talked a lot about the history tonight um, and it's been obvious from the, a lot of the slides we've seen that there's been a massive effort from club members over the years to really evolve the club from to where it is today. You know, we've got a fantastic clubhouse, a great car park area, boat storage. Um, I mean, it's a fantastic asset that many clubs would love to have. 
So what's the vision that you would like to see for the future of the club? <clears throat> well, that, that's that's extremely difficult. <clears throat> just, just a quick word on, on where we're at. The, um, all the rock armour, you see, once again, that's, that's all a difficult job done by members. That was uh, all laid in by Richard Rumney. Um, we increased the size of the car park. Um, <clears throat> and the, buying the ground took some time. The ground in which a clubhouse stands um, was sold to us by Alan Milton. Uh, this bit took about five years negotiating time, but now we own it. So, uh, as you say, many, many clubs in the country um, are on lease arrangements and some pretty precarious. Uh, so, yeah, we, we own the lot. And um, the way ahead, that's very difficult because uh, since day one, you know, 60 odd years ago, uh, society has changed out of all recognition. <clears throat> uh, outdoor activities are wide and varied. Certainly from, from my position, um, really it, it's up, what I'd like to see is uh, um, considered input from, from the members to the committee uh, because no, no committee in its, in, by itself can sensibly uh, crystal ball gaze and get things right. So <clears throat> perhaps the cry is, uh, I hope that in the next few months, we, as we start to sail again, we'll get <clears throat> uh, some suggestions from, from members. Clearly, um, running RYA courses is probably as good a place to start as any. And <clears throat> to perhaps to try and reinstate some of our social sailing. Um, mm -hmm. Although dinghy racing per se has um, declined sub substantially, the keelboat activity has is, is increased in the last two or three years quite dramatically. And on any one weekend, there's probably 30 plus uh, members out cruising. So it's, very difficult to crystal ball gaze and see the way ahead, but um, <clears throat> I, I think um, more emphasis on the social side of sailing, um, running courses again, <clears throat> and um, hopefully receiving uh, considered input from the membership uh, to see how we go. Yeah. Well, well, Hamish, thank you very much for taking us through the 67 years of history of the club. 